Hi, so I'm coming to you today from Anishinaabe traditional lands here in southwestern Ontario. I'm at uh, Western University and Epi and Biostats. And uh, this is an area I've been working in for a while. I've always had a focus on research methods in conjunction with the other work that I've done. So I'm going to talk to you about incorporating intersectionality frameworks into quantitative research, which is a newer area. So most of the quantitative applications of intersectionality have been in the last decade in terms of, of publications. And so it's an area where there's a lot of rapid methods development. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to go into things like sampling, though, of course, you may need to oversample or want to oversample certain groups. I'm happy to entertain any questions that people have, but I'm going to focus a little bit on measurement and then on statistical analysis primarily. But I want to start out by just diving into intersectionality itself. Okay, so intersectionality is a Black feminist theoretical framework. Um, it predates its emergence into scholarly work, but uh, within scholarly work, it's credited to uh, Black legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, who introduced the idea in academic publications in the late 1980s around issues of civil rights uh, cases in the United States that force people to choose between bringing a case under grounds of race or grounds of sex, but not both, which created some really problematic legal decisions. And also with sociologist Dr. Patricia Hill Collins, who really took Black feminist theory and pushed that into sociology with standpoint theory and intersectionality. But these concepts predate the 1980s and 1990s, and they go back to the earlier work of the Black lesbian fem feminist Cumbahee River Collective, and you know even back into the century before that with Sojourner Truth's um, speeches and her work. And so the focus is on the specificity of experiences at different social intersections. And by social intersections, we mean like the intersection of social identities, um, positions, other people's perceptions of one and how they're treated based on perceptions and social processes and context as well. The intersectionality is often called a traveling theory based on Said's idea of a traveling theory. And that means it's moving across disciplinary spaces, geographic spaces and across time. And as it travels, it's interacting with the different context it's traveling through. And that introduced some risks and also some opportunities. So I'm going to talk about what's happening as it's traveling into quantitative research. And importantly, I want to point out that while we sometimes say intersectionality theory, it's not a theory as in a social science theory that you could, you know, create a structural equation model to test out. It's not a hypothesis. You can't test it and reject intersectionality. Rather, it's a framework for how we approach research. And it's a framework that says that not only do we need to look at intersectional heterogeneity, but we need to have these questions and their interpretations really embedded in ideas of social structure and social power. Power, and in a way that allows for these different um, components, so to speak, of people's identities or positions to co-create each other and to coexist in a way that allows for people to be embodied and not dissected down to their component parts. And so uh, within this, I think it's sometimes helpful to start with a metaphor. And my colleague, Dr. Lisa Boleg, has a fabulous one in one of her qualitative papers studying Black, gay, and bisexual men in the US. And one of her participants said, well, it's hard for me to separate my identities. Once you've blended the cake, you can't take the parts back to the main ingredients. And I think this is key because as researchers, we often want to study sexual orientation or we want to study race or ethnicity or indigeneity or socioeconomic status. And when we're doing that, in a sense, we're trying to say, let's take these individuals and let's separate out the ingredients. Whereas intersectionality says that these are created together in such a way that you can't do that uh, for human beings. Now, what I love about this is this metaphor can actually be extended out at great lengths. So we'll try not to torture it, but let's just take this a step further and extend it. Say we're interested in studying the role of eggs within the population of foods. And, and I've got a slide here with some egg containing foods and we could have a slide of, of non-egg foods as well. And the point I want to make here is that all of these within the population of foods are eggs. They contain egg components and yet they're entirely different foods. Some of them are combined with flour, some have sugar, some are savory, some are baked, some are frozen. So they have different ingredients and they've been produced through different processes. 
And they can come out quite different, like two of them, if you look at the egg noodles and the hala, contain almost identical ingredients, with the exception of the yeast and very different processes for producing them. So I think, you know, if we carry this metaphor forward in our work and we think of human beings as being created in ways where you can't separate out the parts, then it helps to illustrate some of the limitations of our research. So if we were to study eggs here, we might come up with some common ideas. Well, eggs play a role as an emulsifier. Eggs may risk introducing salmonella. There might be things that eggs, you know, can can cause within the population of foods. And at the same time, it doesn't make sense in a certain way when you think about it to look at one overall effect without allowing that to play out in very different ways at different intersections within the human population as well. So I'll illustrate this. Um, this isn't an example I want you to necessarily emulate. It's very simple, not the methods I would recommend, but it's really nice to illustrate. And this comes from a paper from the New England Journal of Medicine, where the authors used actors on video to convey two age groups, two racial groups, and two gender groups. And they were looking at physician referrals for cardiac catheterization for their cardiac patients. And in the results, the authors concluded, this little quote I have here, that logistic regression analysis indicated that women and blacks were less likely to be referred for cardiac catheterization than men and whites respectively. And this got picked up in the newspapers and this got taken out you know, with this message, you know, women and blacks less likely to be referred for cardiac catheterization. Now, what was interesting about this paper is that the authors did include another model with an interaction. They didn't report on it much, it was in there. Um, but they, in their findings, also reported on this main effects regression. And so if you look at their interaction model, you can actually see quite clearly, and they do, to be fair, they do point that out in their paper as well, that the referral rate was only lower for Black women. So what happened? When you construct a statistical model that takes what we would say an intersectionality as an additive approach, so it's adding together the average effects of being a man, the average effects of being Black, what happens is you get these misestimates for those groups of black men and of white women because black women are part of both of those groups, right? And so that changes the effect for those groups when you don't allow those intersections to be estimated independently. So that's just a simple illustrative analysis of the errors that can enter our research. And these exist in a lot of papers. You won't see them because the authors haven't necessarily done a different analysis within their paper to compare to it, but they're there just as well. So intersectionality, these kind of quantitative approaches to intersectionality, as I mentioned, are really quite new. So 94% um, of published papers have been in the last decade that are quantitative. But intersectionality was incorporated much earlier in qualitative research. So we were interested in seeing you know, where this work was happening, this quantitative work. And so this is a heat map globally of the country of first authors affiliation because it's all, it's all recent work. And you can see, not surprisingly, the roots in US Black feminism that the majority of the authors, in fact, were from the US, but also from Canada, also from Central and South America, from South Africa, India, China, from Europe, and from Australia. So it definitely is a traveling theory in the sense that it's moving across disciplines. We can see that it's also, in its quantitative applications, moving across countries at this point as well. So I'm gonna have a couple of cautions in this presentation. So we'll stop here for a caution. So rich theoretical frameworks have been stripped of meaning as they travel across geography and disciplines, including into quantitative research. So we as quantitative health researchers have a bit of a bad history on this and that we're often light on theory and it's something we've been critiqued for. Um, in addition, researchers sometimes don't read original sources, but only the ones that introduce things into their field. If you work in the area of syndemics or some of these other theoretical approaches that have moved into quantitative research and epidemiology, you'll realize that a lot of people, to use that example, will refer to Ron Stahl's paper where he introduced it into epidemiology and public health, and they won't necessarily go back and read the original work from anthropology on syndemics. So the same thing happens within intersectionality, that people will use it without having having read the Black Feminist Foundations of Intersectionality. And as terminology becomes trendy, that becomes even more so that it's used without people really diving in and understanding the foundations.
That all said, I see that there are some clear advantages to quantitative approaches and that we as quantitative researchers have some interesting things to contribute to intersectionality and to the development of theory, including things that can inform further qualitative study. One of those is that we have the possibility to harness large population data sets to examine high dimensional data across a large number of intersections, like more than 100 intersections. And so with current research, including a lot of the quantitative research, it's often a limited number of positions that are considered because of the methods people are using. And within qualitative research, it's even narrower because the time and the effort it takes to do qualitative analysis is so intense that you could never imagine exploring in detail 100 intersections qualitatively. So that gives us the possibility of efficiently examining combinations of intersections and not just multiply marginalized positions, which usually have to be prioritized in qualitative work where you can only study a limited number of intersections. And so I think this is important because privilege, most people don't occupy universally marginalized positions and privilege isn't just the absence of adversity. And yet we understand very little about how privilege works to lubricate people's social interactions and to smooth their way um, along in the world. And so in an intersectional sense as well, even just these ideas of privilege and marginalization sometimes play out really differently at different intersections. And so we can't necessarily think of, for example, male privilege. If we talk about police interaction um, amongst uh, a black population, for example, is it really a privilege to be a black man in those cases? I think experience and evidence show that that idea of male privilege is not something that applies, you know, in all situations across all intersections. So that's something that we can look at in these studies. And this gives us the potential to screen for inequalities across infrequently studied intersections as well, which is really important because there's some groups that really rarely get studied. And here I'm just talking about descriptive quantitative approaches where we're describing inequalities. So in terms of tying theory to methods, I'm gonna put in a few references throughout this talk just to refer you to things. The first here is my 2014 paper in social science and medicine, which I wrote specifically for population health researchers who were interested in intersectionality. I think my own thinking has advanced a bit beyond that at this point too, but it really covers some of the challenges and it was written with an idea that you could take it with your own research, read through it and contemplate your own approaches. I also really recommend um, Ford and Arian Bua's paper, also in social science and medicine on public health critical race methodology. So critical race theory and intersectionality, they're just entwined and, and their work in terms of applications of critical race methodology in public health research is another really important source to go to in terms of tying theory to methods. Uh, to kind of wrap up the, the introduction here, I just want to mention ethical considerations whenever we do social identity or position-based research in terms of identifying and protecting uh, vulnerable population subgroups. So I think some things that we need to be conscious of in this kind of work is to avoid in a simplistic way, attaching disease related stigma to groups. You know, we don't wanna create an intersectional body of research that just does this in a more nuanced way than single axis kind of studies of inequity. Um, we want to consider the multidimensionality of social groupings. So I'm gonna talk about that a bit with an eye toward measurement that when we're talking about sex or gender, race or ethnicity or socioeconomic status, these are all multidimensional things. And so we need to really think about what we're measuring and what we're talking about, what role it plays in impacting people's health. And then considering and collecting data on context and potential explanation. So even if we're describing inequalities, a question I like to ask is, if we were to find differences, what would we hypothesize this was from? And then try to collect data on that as well. That way we're not left with a situation where we're just describing inequalities and describing inequalities and describing inequalities. And now we're doing it in greater detail, but it really leaves people with the impression that these are just intractable problems or that they're somehow innate to different groups of people. And it doesn't direct us towards solutions. So I think that's an ethical, thing on our part to collect the kind of data to really help move towards solutions. And then last and obviously not least, providing communities with information needed to understand their health issues and develop their own strategies. And this speaks to our obligations in terms of knowledge translation and to working with communities to make findings relevant and applicable at the intersections at which they exist.
So I'm going to talk about first multidimensionality and measurement, and then I'll move into data analysis. So we do require a pragmatic use of categorization. I know there are anti-categorical approaches to intersectionality. I don't see those as applying in a quantitative sense because we have to accept some level of categorization to do this kind of analysis. But it's important to distinguish whether we're looking at identities, social positions that may not be identities or processes or context or policy contexts, and, and especially to distinguish between things that categorize groups of people based on identity or position and the kinds of context or processes that are modifiable and that might represent points for intervention to reduce inequalities. So here's another reference for something to read if you have not, and that's Indigenous Statistics by Maggie Walter and Chris Anderson. And in this, they really talk with relation to Indigenous research, that multidimensionality. And specifically, in one of Chris Anderson's chapters, he talks about how categorization has so long been based in administrative desires rather than lived reality. And this is categorizations in terms of status under the Indian Act, um, but also in the ways that families that, you know, membership in nation, all these are, have been defined has often been based on administrative desires. But the same thing is true for other groups as well, right? This is an idea that we can take and we can expand out to other areas, whether it's looking how race historically has been encoded on birth certificates, or it's looking at how sex and gender are captured in administrative ways that might not match people's lived realities. So this is a really important kind of critical stance to bring to this in terms of understanding what we're looking at. And they really highlight the differences between identity, community membership, ethnic heritage, ancestry, legal status. And this is similar to what we've been hearing for a long time from critical race scholars around classifications of race, that whether it's a legal or administrative classification, identity, meta-perceived race, ethnicity, that's how you understand other people see you. Metaperception is a psychological term. It's what um, Dr. Nancy Lopez also calls street race, you know, the way people perceive you on the street, which may be different than how you identify. Your experiences of racism or ethnic discrimination, race or ethnicity associated cultural factors that may play a role in health, and then structural racism and its effects and economic marginalization and other structural effects due to policy. And so I'm gonna say this a couple of times, you can measure that. So as quantitative researchers, I think the reason it's really important to look at and understand multidimensionality is because we can measure that. We have the skills to actually evaluate how well our measures measure what we think they're measuring. And if they're not, if we want one dimension and what we have is another, we have the ability to acknowledge that we're using a proxy measure and to evaluate how well that performs as a proxy measure. And yet when it comes to social identity or position, we rarely see this done. We really rarely see this kind of evaluation. And I think it's just based on the tradition of dividing people by social class or race or age or, um, or sex over decades and decades of research and not taking these measures as seriously as we do other measures. So this is a, a tool, a not at all exhaustive tool I created quite a while ago now for researchers just to think about some of the dimensions of sex and gender and, and their cross tabulations between them in terms of their research. But these are mostly all multidimensional as well. And so I just put this out there for researchers as a way of thinking through um, what this might look like in your research in terms of thinking through what dimensions are having the impact on health that you're studying. What, and are you measuring those? And if not, is what you have in terms of measurement a reasonable proxy? So I put that out there and this could be expanded out greatly from there. And in research, what that looks like is around sex and gender looks like cisnormativity, which is not just an issue for trans and gender diverse people. Cisnormative assumptions in research are the assumptions that all these dimensions are concordant within individuals and that that is consistent over the life course. So if you know one thing about somebody, you know them all. And that's not true. So as researchers, we might assume if we have data and the mailbox is checked for a person in there and we're studying COVID, uh, we might assume they have XY chromosomes, they have testicles, they don't have a potentially protective level of estrogen, they've always lived as a boy or man or that they have gendered um, behaviors that might impact our outcome. And so again, I'll say you can measure that. So this is why it's important with regard to your research question to really think through what it is that's potentially impacting health in your situation and um, considering that multidimensionality. 
Within intersectionality research, this is from a systematic review that we have under review. Um, within that, you can see that the majority of studies are studying sex, gender, um, and or race, ethnicity. And they're not always distinguishing the dimension that they're studying. So we've had to group some of these things together. But you can see that intersectionality in terms of quantitative approaches has really extended out into other social status and position variables as well. Uh, and these are all things that relate to stigma or that relate to social marginalization and relate to social power as per intersectionality. In some cases, authors have made arguments around some of those. So disease and health conditions may or may not be stigmatized, may or may not relate to social power, depending on what they are. But there's a, a nice range of um, different social status or position variables that have been studied. So again, I want to differentiate a little bit between identities and other things because the published literature talks a lot about intersectional, intersectionality in terms of intersections of identities. And sometimes it's used as shorthand for things that aren't even really identities. Like, do you have to identify as poor to be affected by poverty? That's often not an identity that people are measuring. We rarely ask, do you identify as poor? But people will still talk about intersections of identity when they talk about poverty or socioeconomic factors. So I think it's important to move beyond identity to help us with this multidimensionality and also to help us move from social status and position to processes that might be driving inequalities. And so, you know, I think about identity versus meta perception and sometimes both being important, like in Lori Ross's work with bisexual identified women, where she's looked at women in heterosexual relationships where they're often not perceived as bisexual and the way that that can impact health. And we can also look at visible and invisible disabilities, for example, and people's very different experiences in those situations. And I think it's also really interesting to study the impacts of people who are not visible in the identity that they're in, because we sometimes sometimes assume that there's a privilege associated with that without acknowledging the stress that comes with that as well. And um, the things that people are exposed to when other people don't recognize them as part of that group. And so I also want to talk about processes because processes can impact health. And so again, important to distinguish between, for example, sexual orientation and experiences of homophobia, which can vary amongst people who have the same sexual orientation identity. And, and with discrimination and stigma, these are also multidimensional. They can be internalized, they can be interpersonal, they can struct, be structural, um, they can be major, they can be day-to-day -day, like microaggressions. And then context, which is our structural factors. So that can be policy context, it can be historical context, it can be neighborhood level or school level context, but Again, important to distinguish between these and not to limit our applications to the study of identities. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about data analysis. And first, I think it's useful to draw on this distinction that comes from epidemiology. We talk about descriptive versus analytic epidemiology. And the reason I make this distinction is because most of the work that's happened in intersectionality has been what I'm calling descriptive intersectionality. It's been focused on quantifying inequalities. So I've already talked about what I see as some of the risks of that in terms of just reinforcing this idea of intractability and inequality. And so I really want to push people to move toward what I'm calling analytic intersectionality, which is looking at the causes of inequalities, helping to identify intervention strategies, looking at how those might play out differently for people at different intersections who are having these experiences in a different social uh, and historical context. So I'm going to talk primarily about descriptive intersectionality. I'll move a little bit into analytic. So for descriptive work, you know, some of the simplest options that people apply in analysis are things you're probably familiar with, cross-classification and multiple regression with interaction terms. So cross-classification is just the idea of, you know, if we wanted to look at, in this case, six ethno-racial groups and two categories of people being or not being sexual or gender minorities, we can just cross-classify to produce 12 groups. Now we've got a categorical variable that has 12 different groups and we can do any analysis we wanna do with that. So if we wanna describe that, we could look at um, means, we could look at frequencies, we could describe box plots. And this is just from an example analysis in one of my papers. And what's interesting about it, just with this simple example analysis is it's looking at psychological distress across these groups. And there's two groups that have higher levels of psychological distress, um, statistically significantly higher than all 10 of the others. And they're two really rarely studied intersections, Indigenous and Middle Eastern 
sexual and gender minority people. So I think that's just a nice illustration in terms of how even with a simple example analysis, it can highlight intersections that are less frequently studied. I think most people who've done any course in statistics will be familiar with multiple regression with the potential to do a saturated regression model where you encode interactions between variables. This is one of the most common methods that people use because it's a go-to method that people know. Um, that doesn't mean it's the best method to use. And, and there are some issues regarding the scale of the interactions. When you've got a linear regression as on top, you're operating in an additive scale, but we do a logistic regression as on the bottom or any log scale regression like Poisson or Cox regressions. Um, you're actually, when you're adding together exponents, you're multiplying. So you're looking at interactions in a multiplicative scale, which is less relevant for causal questions and less relevant for public health impact. So I'm just flagging that as an issue to dive into if that's a method that you want to use. But um, this is one method that people use. And then um, people are moving into machine learning methods, um, which is a, a subclass of artificial intelligence. They're supervised methods, which means you as a researcher give the algorithm the variables or categories you want used. And so here in this example, your root node at the top, that's your entire sample. And there's um, splitting criteria, and there's stopping criteria that are different across different types of decision tree methods. So here the first split is by age. And if you look at that older age group, age greater or equal to 62, that's the top green box, you see there's no further splitting. So theoretically, every intersection you're interested in is encapsulated in that, but all intersections that include people older than age 62 are um, in that one group as having the same outcome outcome estimate, whereas the other node splits down further based on other factors. So some of these methods do give you a visual representation like this tree. And so that's one thing people are using. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the methods in this table. So I'll leave this up as I talk about it. This is from my former student, Mary Mahendran's thesis um, that I've adapted and added a bit to. And so there's cross classification on the left. That's her simple categorical description. And then two regression approaches. So I've shown you regression with interactions. And there's another one that's often called META, which stands for a multi-level analysis of individual heterogeneity and discriminatory accuracy. And what that is, is a multi-level model with individual level data. So it's not like a social epidemiology model where you've got neighborhood effects or group level effects. And it's not like the, the way we use multi-level models with repeated measures in a cohort study. You, it can be used with cross-sectional data. It's just using people's social identities or positions at the first level and then encoding the intersections at the second level. And then I've got several machine learning approaches here, classification or regression trees, C trees, conditional inference trees, Chade is chi-squared automatic interaction detector. And then random forest, which as it sounds is actually a method that uses bootstrapping to produce a forest of trees and then aggregates across those instead of using a single tree. And so if we look at these, we chose to evaluate these because they will all produce outcome estimates for intersections. So we're assuming everybody who wants to do descriptive work is interested in that. Now, only the methods on the left, not the machine learning methods, will give you variances or confidence intervals if you want to have an estimate of precision around those. Um, some of them include hypothesis testing, though with a note of caution, they're testing out different things from each other. And whether or not those hypothesis tests are really relevant for intersectional questions is an ongoing subject of debate. And the same with effect size estimates, things like relative risks or differences. You get those from some things and whether they're relevant is an ongoing source of debate. Um, META and the decision tree methods are the ones that are not cumbersome with very large numbers of intersections. They can accommodate hundreds of intersections potentially, whereas the others are limited to smaller numbers. And then uh, the checks here for the ones that can use continuous social position variables, like if you wanted to use a continuous measure of household income, not everything can incorporate that. Some require things to be categorized. And then those single decision tree models, those three, th those are the ones that give you visual subgroup identification like trees. Though I'll caution that that's not always an advantage. When you have a lot of splits, those can become so complicated that you know they're so small and the font is so small, it's not something you can easily look at. But if that's important to you, these are just some of the characteristics of these different methods.
Now I can't show you all of this. This is actually um, a paper in development. We're gonna have the first one with categorical outcomes submitted shortly. And then there's a second paper with dichotomous outcomes. But what we're doing in these is we're actually simulating data because we wanted to know how accurately these measures predict for these different intersections because existing studies will use real world data. You don't know what the truth is, but if we simulate data across a range of sample sizes, a range of different types of interaction, a range of different data scenarios, then we can actually look at how accurately they estimate. So on the y-axis here, that's mean square error. We have continuous outcomes. And here are the methods. You're probably gonna notice some patterns, which is why I put these up, even though I don't have um, the complete results for you. And so probably the first thing you notice is that CART doesn't look so good there with the blue box plots, the error is high. And um, while I've heard some people argue that one of the advantages of CART is that it doesn't perform less well at small sample sizes, which is true, it's because it performs poorly across all sample sizes. And so that is one method that we wouldn't recommend with the caveat that we have implemented it according to default or standard types of parameters that people would most often use. And it may be possible that by adjusting those, people may find ways to improve its performance. Um, what's called here overspecified regression is saturated regression. It's actually what we've coded in all the interaction terms, whether they exist in the data or not, because of course in the real world, you don't know the underlying data structure. Um, you'll see there that as we know that that might not be so good at, with large numbers of intersections, at small sample sizes, but it does improve dramatically a sample size increase. And at those higher sample sizes, pretty much everything but CART performs well in terms of error. So that's important. In terms of our key results, in terms of what we'd recommend as a result of these, I mean, I just would say at this point, while we're still working on the results, I'm not recommending CART for intersectional analysis at this point, unless somebody comes along and shows a way to make it perform better. For the smaller sample sizes, and we were looking at a large number of intersections, and so, um, it could go smaller than our, our 2000 was our smallest, but we had, I think, 192 intersections, a lot. And so, um, so with a smaller number of intersections that would apply at smaller sample size. Meta actually works really well in terms of estimating things. We've critiqued it about some other things about what people sometimes call intersectional estimates, not measuring what people think they're measuring, but as, as uh, something to estimate outcome frequency or outcome mean for intersections, it performed really well. Um, C-Tree and Chade did as well and, um, and Random Forest. And so at large sample sizes, everything but CART worked really well. And uh, we looked at some of their ability to identify important variables, but I'm not focusing on that today because that may or may not be relevant. And because I want to veer a little bit into analytic intersectionality. And so here I want to kind of move this in a little bit of a different direction, say, okay, so what if we're not just concerned with inequalities across intersections, but we want to look at, at causal relationships potentially confounders aren't in here, but we're going to assume we're controlling for confounding in these. We're really interested in looking at causal relationships. We might be interested in a possible cause and its impact, and we want to take an intersectional approach, as in the diagram on the left, by looking at potentially effect measure modification across intersection groups. So that possible cause might be happening in a different historical, different social context, even if we're theoretically measuring the same thing for people at different intersections. If they're experiencing discrimination, let's say people are being called names, that can have a different weight, a different valence, depending on somebody's intersection and that, that social and historical context. So rather than treating these groups as confounders to control for, one way we can look at those things intersectionally is by taking an effect measure modification approach and considering um, not just whether or not there are, are differences in that potentially causal relationship across age or ethno-racial group or these single axis factors, but across intersections. And so for that, we may have to, we're not gonna look at hundreds of intersections. We're gonna to have to make some decisions based on existing knowledge, whether that's community knowledge or academic um, literature that we're drawing on as to what intersections might be important and where we'd expect there might be variation. Or we could kind of go a step beyond that. And if you look at that one on the right, you'll see those kind of causal arrows are exactly between the same factors, except we could look at that as, as a uh, mediation example where we're interested in the effects of these intersectional groups on an outcome. And we're interested in how that might be mediated 
by these other factors. So to what extent are those inequalities potentially being driven by these other mediating factors? And we can do that in a way that incorporates, this is important, in a way that incorporates interaction. So we're not assuming that that possible cause again plays the same role at all intersections. We're allowing that to vary um, by incorporating interaction with our mediation. So if we go back to my example uh, of those ethno-racial and sexual gender minority groups, um, if you're familiar with directed acyclic graphs and you're looking on the right, I just want to note that those gray arrows are not standard protocol notation. I'm just trying to show that there's interaction. And so we can conceptualize that as in some papers and saying at different levels of the mediator, the effect of our intersections and our outcome is going to be different, but it makes more sense to say what is mathematically equivalent, which is we conceptualize it as that mediator may play a different role in the outcome for people at different intersections. And we're going to not just predict outcomes differently across different intersections, but we're going to allow processes to vary across different intersections as well. And one way that we can do that, and I know this is going to be far too much for people who haven't seen it before to digest on a webinar. Um, so it's from a paper in Social Science and Medicine on intersectional mediation decomposition. There are other ways that people could do this type of an analysis. If you're somebody who is really familiar with structural equation models, you could create something similar in that way. You can use Preacher and Hayes methods to do mediated interactions as well. But what I like about Vanderweel's decomposition approach that I've adapted for intersectional analysis policies here is that it decomposes into three effects that have really clear interpretation for public health. Now you're not doing an intervention, but often we've got the data we've got, we want to push our results as far forward as we can in terms of informing interventions. And that's where I think this is useful because you can decompose into that pure direct effect. That's the non-mediated effect. And that has a really clear counterfactual interpret interpretation where it, it models a theoretical intervention. So in the example I had where there's day-to-day -day discrimination and psychological distress, what we're doing is saying, what's the intersection that experiences the lowest levels of psychological distress? Let's call that an achievable goal. It exists for one intersection. It doesn't say no discrimination. It doesn't say nobody's never called a name. It says, here's an achievable goal potentially. Now, what would happen theoretically if we took another intersection and we reduce their day-to-day -day discrimination down to that hypothetically achievable lower level we've observed in our other group. What would that do? Would there still be a difference for people at that intersection at a reduced level of discrimination? So you can see that that's a really relevant public health question in terms of how it's structured. And then that indirect effect, the mediated effect that goes through I'll just flip back, that goes through day-to-day -day discrimination to psychological distress, those arrows that go across the top there, that gets decomposed into two effects, what we call a pure indirect effect and a mediated interaction. And those are simply the effects first of experiencing different levels of discrimination. And secondly, discrimination having a different effect on the outcome at different intersections. So we can split that out. We can say some of the differences we're seeing may be due to different levels of experiences of discrimination. We know there's different levels of experiences of discrimination across those groups. And we're still also allowing for this third effect to say maybe discrimination doesn't have the same effect on, on psychological distress for all groups. And then if we do that, um, I made a, a pretty picture because that's worth a thousand words, right? We can see that if we were to model that out that way, we would still have an excess um, level of psychological distress in those two highest groups, the indigenous and Middle Eastern sexual and gender minority groups. It's reduced, um, but there's still a, a statistically significant effect, which is indicated by the asterisk here. Um, conversely, we see that our black non-sexual gender minority group is now has lower levels of psychological distress in the absence of the excess discrimination that they're experiencing. There's competitive mediation there and these findings. So discrimination is still having an adverse effect on psychological distress, but in the absence of that, people would be doing even better. And that's actually pretty consistent with the literature. And then um, if we look at those indirect effect breakdowns, what we see here is a pretty clear story from these data where it looks like what's really driving these are different levels of day-to-day -day discrimination. And that's significant across 
um, these groups, there wasn't really a difference with the Asian um, non-sexual gender minority group. For all the others, that's, that's really what's going on here. And there's no evidence of an effect from mediated interaction. And again, we're just talking about day-to-day -day discrimination here. There's other forms of discrimination that could be impacting psychological distress as well, like those major discriminatory events, you know, human rights, actionable type of events. But I just want to give this as an example of one way that people could approach analytic intersectionality. And that is to cycle back around here. So at a minimum, then, if we're looking at this, this is at a minimum. Uh, what does it take for a quantitative analysis to be intersectional? And I'm going to say that it has to do with a focus on categories, first of all, that represent intersections of axes of social power, no power, no intersectionality. So if you're interested in looking at interactions, that's not intersectional unless it's really focused around social power. Not every interaction represents an intersection. And then you need statistical methods that allow each intersection to have its own outcome levels that are estimated independently, not as a sum of their parts, like not with a main effects regression where you're just adding together average effects for each independent or each individual factor as though it's independent because it's not. Uh, and then where processes that generate outcomes are studied, you also want your statistical methods to allow for those processes to unfold differently across different intersections. And then lastly, you're, you have to interpret this in an intersectional way as well. And so this is where I come to my, my second caution here is that you know, when we get into methodology, sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the details of methods, but the methods alone don't make your work intersectional. What I'm presenting and what I, I want people to keep working on are just multi-purpose tools that are useful in a tool chest of somebody who wants to take an intersectional approach to their work. Uh, doing this requires a firm grounding in black feminist theory. You need to know how to use that tool. And doing so means that incorporation of social power structures in your theoretical framework, your choice of measures and your interpretation, and also uh, attention to research processes, including involvement of communities under study. Now, I, I deliberately didn't put that in my last slide at what's minimally required, because I do think there's a role for broad exploratory studies across hundreds of intersections. And it doesn't make any sense to try to involve you know, people at hundreds of different intersections in designing a study that's really about exploring inequalities. But if that type of study comes out with results that may impact communities, then that may be where people are getting involved at the interpretation stage. And certainly for a study that focuses on a smaller number of intersections, and then we're talking about community engaged research processes. And so lastly, as an agenda for people who really are interested in methods and want to work on methods, some things I think that need additional work include how the range of statistical methods proposed um, can embed an explicit theory um, for descriptive intercategorical intersectionality can embed an explicit theoretical frame um, because you can use these methods a theoretically. Uh, I think we don't know a lot about what's called intercategorical approaches and what that means quantitatively. Like what does it mean to explore within a particular group? And is that really different? And is that a meaningful distinction for quantitative approaches? The appropriateness of confounding control strategies when we're looking at that analytic work um, is something that's being debated in terms of the best ways to approach that to be most relevant in terms of what effects are being estimated. And then differential constructs. So we talked a little bit about multidimensionality, but there are some things that only make sense for people at particular intersections and that we might only be able to measure for people at particular intersections or that we might be able to measure across a range of intersections, but they have different meanings for people at different intersections. And this really interfaces with the quantitative analysis methods that we use, because if you could only measure something for a subgroup of intersections, how are you going to analyze it across all intersections? And if you measure something across all intersections, but the measure performs differently because it has different meaning at different intersections, then are you really talking about the same thing? And so this is an area for investigation in terms of measures development, but also in terms of how we evaluate and validate measures, which is rarely done in an intersectional way. So I'm flagging that for all the measurement people. Uh, a better incorporation of structural factors, including through multi-level mediation and all forms of multi-level modeling. And then methods for decision support to bridge between an intersectional analysis and public health interventions. So oftentimes we find inequalities, like the first knee-jerk reaction is to say, there's a problem in this group, let's study this group, let's intervene on this group, but that's not logically 
B doesn't follow from A there logically that you intervene on that group. Sometimes the best interventions are universal interventions or population interventions and, and are not necessarily targeting those groups. And when we target those groups, we also run the risk of attaching stigma to those groups. So that's something I think in terms of decision support that needs work as well. And so very, very lastly, there's my thank you slide um, that light bulbs of brilliance are of people who are co-authors on published or pending work that I'm presenting and everybody else here is brilliant as well they just aren't a co-author on this work so I'd like to just thank my uh, students staff and colleagues who were involved in this thank you